all of these texts where they have to toe a weird line. They need to toe a line, with the exception of the so-called Gnostic literature, for whom dualism is their answer. Monism comes with the pro- with a problem, right? Monism comes with a problem that clearly evil exists, and you got to do something with it. You have to explain where it comes from and how to defeat it. The, the world itself is somehow deficient and broken, and the task is to climb out of it. Ancient Alexandria was that you had 15, 20 different groups of people out there in the streets of Alexandria being like, we found it, right? Whether it's the Stoics with their apatheia, whether it's the Way of Hermes, whether it was the, the various schools of so-called Gnosticism, or it was the various schools of so-called Christianity, you know, the Jews. What a society it must have been. You talk about the marketplace of ideas, but, you know, it's nothing like it must have been back then. It must have been a positive, this cornucopia of, of people competing. And can you imagine a world where there's a hermeticist and a, and a Gnostic and, a, you know, the middle platonic philosophers looking down their nose at everyone? No one's going to get left out of salvation. Everyone was shopping. And can you imagine being that illiterate shopper? And you can't read these books. You can't read what they said. You're like, have you heard about the way of Hermes? Have you heard about the way of Valentinus? Have you heard about the way of Jesus? Have you heard about the way of, of Seth? I just want to re- reemphasize that I, I really do appreciate you taking the time, um, especially on a show like this that's just getting started out. So, um, hey, man, I, look, everybody starts at zero subscribers. So mm-hmm. I remember my, I distinctly remember looking at my thing and looking at it and it said zero subscribers. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, you know, you're a great guy. You're clearly like, you know, you're doing the hard work of uh working through this material and so i'm i'm absolutely want to support support you and also just like i think that you're going to be a really great content creator in terms of creating um non-clickbaity really good venues for for scholars to discuss so i want i want to be on the ground floor of that man oh thank you um like i said i wanted to talk about point boundaries mm-hmm. um i just kind of went through it and so i wanted to touch upon um a subject that you know a thing or two about, um, apocalyptic literature, uh, the Merkaba uh, literature, things like that. Um, but I wanted to look at it from the lens of um, hermetic literature mm-hmm. um, and just kind of, what, maybe we can't say that it's genetic borrowing, but we can definitely tell that there's something going on there in terms of like, it's in, it's in the ether, so to speak. Um, and I just want to put out a disclaimer for our viewers. Uh, when we compare these subjects, uh, we are not saying they're genetic links. Uh, I am following Jonathan Z. Smith's axiom that for any kind of comparison to be interesting, we have to posit that there's a difference and the differences make it interesting. So that's where we're coming from. We're not saying this character is like this dying and raising God or whatever. We're just comparing the text for their own sake. Um, so we're going to talk about Poimandres, Dr. Sledge. So in this text, um, the character uh, really seems to be kind of almost in a manic state. He's, he's almost like in an in a altered state of consciousness, like you see in something like in the um, Gnostic um, Nag Hammadi literature, like something like Zostrianos, like they're in this state of almost mania. And then they have this vision of this, you know, of Poimandres, who's basically like a Dr. Manhattan type character, I imagine. <laughs> Le- know, less, so. less frightening, I think, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, less frightening. And I think, I think in fact, I, th- I think the Corpus of Medicum, either 13 or 11, does use the term mania for the state they're in. So that, I think you're exactly right. That is the, uh, that is the, you know, in the, the Corpus of Medicum is leaning on the old platonic idea of the mania and, um, and the Phaedrus, uh, among other texts. But yeah, I think this is, uh, this is they, they are in an ultra state of consciousness. And I would argue, I think that, um, that Corpus Medicum one is downstream of someone's, um, um, it's downstream of phenomenology, which is to say, this is a text that, re- that this is a text that is, the, I think is the result of someone's mystical experience. 
uh, ditto with the discourse in the eighth and the ninth and, and stuff like that. So I think that a lot of this literature is downstream of, of phenomenology. Yeah, one thing I found really interesting about Poimandres is um, when you compare it with something like On the Origin of the World, uh, Reality of the Rulers and Nag Hammadi Codex uh, and the Nag Hammadi Codices, um, while those texts seem to have a very negative view of all this stuff, like Poimandres is almost like a love story. And I know that um, Hanegraaff kind of thinks similar. I no, found no, out about this actually. Um, oh, yeah, you're absolutely. Just... I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the Corpus and Medicum calls the world the, the second god, and so, and the, by the world they mean the physical cosmos, right? Um, and and as we've mentioned before, the Corpus and Medicum is a spectrum. Some texts are more dualists, some texts are more monists, but Pomandres is very solidly on the on the team of the the cosmos is the second god, and insofar as it is a second god, derivative of the first unknown god or or maybe noose it is beautiful it is perfect it is sublime um this is not you know the nightmare that is the hypostasis of the archons or whatever where the universe is a prison and, and all this sort of stuff uh no like this is a uh, you break through this is sort of the cosmos moment call a la carl sagan right where you you get to gaze into the beauty of of the cosmos, and the not only do you get to gaze into the beauty of it, but the beauty of it embraces you. And that, I think Absolutely. that is that is. I don't know about you, Jason. You know, I'm so awash in Nagamati. I'm so awash in 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 so much of this sort of world pessimism that exists in a lot of this ancient literature. That when you read Poimandres, it really comes across as positively beautiful, where. Uh, where you you poke your head through the veil and the and the beauty of the of the cosmos uh, elevates and, and and embraces you, it's just such a refreshing um, such a refreshing change of pace compared to you know like you said the only origin of the world or uh, the hypo or on the reality of the rulers and you're like oh god more archons <laughs> yeah and I can completely see where. Um... I know that it's probably not the most historical thing to do, but I like to read things like when I'm reading it personally as a reader from a more empire critical standpoint. Um, so I can totally understand where on the origin of the world or, you know, reality of the rulers are coming from, you know, when they're like, oh, okay, you were a fool, Sockless, you're not the creator of the world. But I just want to contrast that kind of attitude with what you find in Poimandres 114. So I'm just going to read this really quickly. So this is from Poimandres 114. The man broke through the vaults and, stopped and stooped to look through the cosmic framework. Nature smiled for love when she saw him. In the water, she saw the shape of man's fairest form. When the man saw the water like himself, as it was in nature, he loved it. Nature took hold of her beloved, hugging him all about and embraced him, for they were lovers. That's from the Copen Haber translation. That is just mind blowing to me. Just like oh, the beauty of that, you know. It's, it's so great. And also, I love the, you know, if you read some of the early alchemical literature also produced in the Alexandrian context, one of my favorite writers is Pseudo Democritus. And uh, his, his favorite refrain is always, Nature rejoices in nature, uh, which tells me actually that I think a lot of these early Hermeticists, there's a reason why alchemy and Hermeticism got linked together. I think that that I, I, we could go into this more, but I think that there actually are there's a there's a genetic relationship there, and I think the fact that the deep interest in the technical hermetica in alchemy is only possible because of the deep philosophical love of nature. Because if you fundamentally hate nature, and if nature is fundamentally bad, in nature all of this is evil then you only want to get out of it. You don't want mm -hmm. to tinker around with it to understand it better, to learn to rejoice in it. Nature rejoices in nature. And I really I really love not only the, the deep sublimity of Poimandres in the Hermeticum uh, when it comes to their love of the physical world, their love of being embodied at some level, but also the uptake of that in the, in the, in the physicalism of um learning to tinker with it in, in terms of alchemy 
And so I, I think those two things are very close. I think they're actually genetically related. And I have a, uh, it just makes me very um, happy uh, in a way, in a way that I've never, I've never personally understood the interest in Gnosticism, but I, I really do at some level dig hermeticism um, precisely because of that, right? The, that beautiful view of physical reality uh, and not the diminishing of it. Uh, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And yeah, we can definitely talk further about um, these alchemical things. That's definitely your area. I'm not as well versed in alchemy, alchemy at all. Um, that's why I go to your videos. I'm like, oh, he knows so much about all this stuff. And it's just so awesome. Um, you know, I, I used to read a lot of Crowley and, and uh, Dion Fortune and all that stuff when I was in college. And um, apparently after I left, like, like you said, there was a explosion and um, quote unquote respectability for this stuff. So mm -hmm. that's definitely exciting for me. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely enjoying all the um, scholarship resources that I do get from your channel and your Patreon. So thank you for that. Of course. So uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, just kind of, we talked about the more positive aspects of Poimandri's. Um, Let's kind of circle back to the adjacent um, Jewish apocalyptic elements mm -hmm. that you find in the pseudepigraphical literature. Um, Second Enoch, Enoch was a really big um, parallel I kind of saw because, um, you know, you have this concept in the point monitors of, of casting off the vices mm -hmm. and the spheres. And you kind of find the same thing in um, something like uh, Second Enoch with when he's talking about like the, the sun and the, the moon and all the different um, deities. I can't remember what chapter it was, but, uh, and then something in Testament of Solomon where he's talking to the, the seven demons. Right. And uh, it's just, is this something that's just common coin at the time? Um, or is it some kind of more conscious borrowing in the Hermetica? I, it's so hard to say, right? That what, what's the, you know, what, what's the, what's the cultural milieu and what's the genetic borrowing? You know, it's impossible to draw these lines. It seems to me that there is some sense um, in all of these texts where they have to toe a weird line. They need to toe a line with the exception of the so-called Gnostic literature for whom dualism is their answer. Uh, and that's not true of all so-called Gnostics either. Um, monism comes with a, pro with a problem. Right, monism comes to the problem that clearly evil exists. Clearly, evil exists, and you got to do something with it. You have to explain where it comes from and how to defeat it. And I think that the way that a lot of non-dualists deal with it is by positing that there is some kind of minor cosmic tragedy that is overcomable, and that minor cosmic tragedy um, is at some of a link with the structure of reality. And um, one has to pass out of the structure of, of physical reality to ultimately undo it. And so that's true of, of uh, lots of texts. It's true of the Merkava literature. Uh, that's true of uh, so-called Gnostic literature. It's true of the Corpus Medicum. You see it in Second Enoch. Um, even the Ascension of Isaiah, right, where he has to you know go down and go up. Um, so... What they do, right, is they basically say that the, the world itself is somehow deficient and broken, and the task is to climb out of it, um, or at least the broken aspects of it. So it seems like this was just a, a way of, of, of answering the question where you have a relatively omnipotent God, which is true of lots of these traditions, most of them, that aren't radically dualist. And the way that you fix it is saying, well, there's a radically perfect God that created a uh, uh, that from which an imperfect universe emerged and the task is to ultimately ascend out of that imperfection. And then there's a shade of how imperfect it is, right? You know, um, from Plotinus where matter is just basically the last bits of uh, reality tattering off into the void. Always imagine like uh, the end of your, uh, the end of your uh, genes tattering off into the dirt and stuff as they weather out. I always like that image of Plotinus's vision of, of matter um, or, you know, whatever image. 
But for whatever reason, in the corpus medicum, right, is the idea that you have these daimons that actually penetrate into your soul that are stuck in you, uh, and you have to basically exercise of them, and then you can, you know, ascend into into the uh, the Ogdua, the Inyad, and maybe beyond. Um, so they all have some flavor of that, um, and some of them even have more radical versions. You know, in in Thirty Knock, right, where you can be transformed into an angel, and maybe even in Paul, where you can be transformed. Uh, in some kind of way, you ascend and, and become transformed. So I think all of them have some version of, of that because they have to square a very simple problem. The If the world, if there's just the one, how do we get to plurality and why is that plurality bad? Uh, and you can see it in the Neoplatinian theory of procession and recession. Uh, you can see it in the Christian theory of salvation. You can see it in the the um, in the Hermetic version of ascending through the the spheres up to the Agdo Adeniad. They all have some version of that, and I think that it's not because they're borrowing from each other so much, is that they have a shared set of philosophical, they have a shared philosophical problem, and they offer different solutions for that philosophical problem. And by the way, you still see that being worked itself out in the Middle Ages. The Kabbalah assumes a basically Neoplatonian framework. And even in the 13th century, it's a shocking how similar the Kabbalistic answer is in the 1280s in the Zohar that you see in literature of the second, third, and fourth centuries of the Common Era. And it's not because they're influencing each other. It's because once you assume a certain logic, only other certain kinds of logics are going to get you out of it. And you don't have to, there doesn't have to be some kind of like red thread of Gnosticism you know, needled all the way through the this and the that and the cathars and all this, you just assume certain kinds of problems and you're going to only have a certain kind of solution set. And that solution set is going to look pretty similar. And unsurprisingly, uh, they look pretty similar, all things told. Well said, well said. Um, so our final question, um, kind of getting away from the, the muck of creation and the the question the, the the existential questions that all these people have while creating an, an identity um i wanted to end on a more positive note just talking about um you know poimandre's you know at the end um you know starting in poimandre's 126 he he's he's kind of returning from his you know ascent and he's coming sure. down and uh you know similar to something like zostrianos and you know nag hamadi uh codex uh you know, eight, you know, one, you know, he's, they, they both have this mission and, but you could tell with Poimandre as, as opposed to Zostrianos, it's more, it almost feels kind of more elitist to me versus with Poimandre it's a very, um, it's a very lush kind of um, exhortation to his fellow man, you know, to save yourself, you know, and I'll, you know, um, I just, I don't know, just, I was just wondering your thoughts on that. I think this is idea of it's comparable maybe to the bodhisattvas or something of the Eastern traditions where, and this goes back to Plato, right? When people forget that the allegory of the cave is a, is a dialectical story. The person in the cave leaves, sees the truth and comes back, right? In the allegory of the cave, the guy comes back to the people in the cave. Um, that image, I think, made an indelible impression upon many, many people. And so Poimandres, um, and um, and it's a pity that um, the, the text you mentioned, right? We It's so fragmentary that it's hard to piece together all that's going on there. I think it's the longest text in Nakamadi, actually, uh, Zostrianos. Um, yeah, I think the idea is that if you find the truth and the truth really provides salvation for you, you can't keep it hidden. You you, you reveal it. You, you try to use it to save people. And... Yeah, the Zostrianos text does strike me as a little more elitist, but it's not like Poem Andres is like kind to people. He calls them like drunkards and sleepwalkers, and uh, he's not exactly like uh, easy on them as, as it goes. But um, yeah, I mean, same with Jesus and other kinds of these characters. Um, the idea, right, is that they discover some truth and they and they try to they try to save us with it. Um, at some level, I guess. I like that story so much more than I found the truth and now let me initiate the tiny elect few who will be worthy of the the message. And this is a, a, a this is a thing about esotericism that I really dislike is the elitism that comes with it that uh, 
that I found the message and now let me do the work of, you know, uh, of initiating the tiny few of people that, that are worthy of the message or, or whatever. I like Pomandres in this way because Pomandres, uh, Plato too, right? He comes back to the cave is all of us. We're all in the cave. Mm-hmm. He comes back to all of us. Um, Zostrionis too, to some degree, although it's a little more uh, uh, elect based, but I am, you know, I think that the idea of when you find a breakthrough truth or spiritual truth or whatever, um, yeah, the share it, you know, you, 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 you can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't hide a light in a bushel. And I like the idea of, of getting it out there. And I do think that that's what I like about at least my romantic view of ancient Alexandria was that you had 15, 20 different groups of people out there in the streets of Alexandria being like, we found it, right? Whether it's the Stoics with their apatheia, whether it's the way of Hermes, whether it was the, the various schools of so-called Gnosticism, where it was the various schools of so-called Christianity, you know, the Jews, uh, all these different groups. Um, what a sight it must have been, you know? Uh, yeah, we, talk about the market, we, we talk about the marketplace of ideas, but, you know, it's nothing like it must have been back then. Uh, it must have been a positive, this cornucopia of, of people competing. And can you imagine a world where there's a hermeticist and a, and a Gnostic and, uh, the, you know, the middle platonic philosophers looking down their nose at everyone? And um, it must have just been, um, you know, for the hoi polloi, for the illiterate masses, which you know, most people were, um, you know, it must have been because they were shopping, right? Everyone was mm-hmm. shopping. Everyone's shopping. No one's going to get left out of salvation. Everyone's shopping. And can you imagine being that illiterate shopper? And you can't read these books. You can't read what they said, you know. And to have to go to the marketplace and be like, have you heard about the way of Hermes? Have you heard about the way of Valentinus? Have you heard about the way of Jesus? Have you heard about the way of of Seth? Um, Man, it must have been. Uh, an exciting time, but also fraught. I mean, I'd hate to have made so many decisions, but um, but yeah, I, I think that that you can hurt you. You can esotericize your way out of a job, uh, which is what I don't want to do. <laughs> um, you can you can esoter- I mean, if you're if you're if your truth that you discovered is so secret and so powerful and so special that only you and three of your friends will ever be worthy of learning about it. Um, probably you're going to esotericize your way out of a job. And I do like Zostrianos and Poimandres where they, uh, they take these extreme revelations and they say, no, we're going to put them out there and we're going to see who bites. We're going to see who believes it. We're going to see if they want to join our group or uh, community or, or what have you. And I find that to be just like a, a terribly fascinating glimpse into the world that must have been the um, the, the frothing milk of ancient Alexandrian intellectual and spiritual life. Well said. I couldn't say it better myself. Um, yeah, I mean, and that brings up an amazing point. Um, you, you can't really imagine like those Neoplatonic philosophers and like say Eunabius. Like, uh, you're not going to imagine, like, uh, Ammonius Sakas, like, in the Agora, like, <laughs> you know, shouting out his ideas of, uh, um, you know, to the, the whole marketplace, you know. He's he's more, like, with his own um, oh, oh, his yeah, own no. circle, you know. Oh, right. Ammonius Sakas is by himself with his own circle, perhaps, but I'm sure Ammonius Sakas had his hype man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody has to have a hype man. And so, uh, you know, hype, yeah, Ammonius Sakas had his guy out being like, have you heard about Ammonius Sakas? And, <laughs> you know, uh, he knows the thing. And, and of course, you know, Plotinus. Plotinus, and, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Plotinus. And maybe even, or, did Origin study under Ammonius Sakas? Um, no, I can't but, remember who exactly he studied under. I know he didn't yeah. study under one of those guys. Yeah, um, so, but you, you don't learn. Yeah. Anything. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but <laughs> again, like, uh, Everyone has a hype man, and so I think that uh, uh, again, the whoever wrote the Corpus Medicum may have not been the guy, may have not been the hype man, but 
I'm sure they had some guy, you know, hawking. I was thinking like Marxists, all the schools of Marxism, all hawking papers. <laughs> I imagine it was, uh, uh, you read, you read, you read this, you know, I, you know, out there reading the in Corpus Medicum one. Yeah. I like the, uh, the analogy Dylan Burns tells about, um, he has this analogy where, uh, you know, this, the way the Sethian literature kind of transmitted, it was kind of like those, uh, the satanic panic, you know, just getting it back to your channel. Like, it's like, Hey, have you heard the true story about Genesis? Have you heard, uh, you read this, uh, really hot new deep cut called, uh, uh, the Ap Apocryphon of John or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's of John, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a trying to like get Slayer, Slayer records and sneaking them into your room or something. Um, but Dr. Sledge, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Of course, man. Where can people find you? Yeah, man. They can find me uh, on mostly on YouTube. You know, I don't have a lot of other social media because it scares the hell out of me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm on YouTube uh, as, uh, under Esoterica. That's sort of my my bag. And, and folks can also find me on, on my Patreon and, um, you know, support the work I, I try to do of providing, you know, again, uh, I'm trying not to esotericize myself out of a job, despite the name of my channel. It's all about trying to make Esoterica accessible uh, in a way that's scholarly and rigorous uh, and fun. I mean, also I try to have fun with this stuff. So uh, yeah, folks can find me there. Well, Justin Sledge, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank of course, man. Thank you.